I already started it two minutes ago. I've been waving at you. Start the music. <laughs> oh, you're the music. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were gonna. You were working together. Um, 
If that's something you'd like to take up, the United Fellowship hasn't been meeting since the pandemic hit, and so we still need toothpaste, individually wrapped bar soap and body wash, uh, deodorant, washcloths, and hand towels. So if any of those that you um, would like to donate, you can uh, bring them in and leave them in the narcotics, I'm assuming. Okay. Wonderful. We appreciate your, uh, appreciate your help with that. Um, also, I'd like to uh, mention that um, this is the last Sunday for our benevolence for Phoebe Wincombe Home. Um, Phoebe is very near and dear to my heart. My mom lived there for five years. I can't say enough good things about them. So please be generous. Um, also, Ruth had an announcement. Uh, good morning. I am, for the first time ever, I'm getting a chance to be a delegate to the National Synod for the UCC this summer. So I'm very excited. And um, I, if, if you have anything that you would like uh, passed on to the conference or eventually to the conference to the Synod, let me know. Um, the resolution, well, we have resolutions every uh, two years at the Synod. And the resolution that I am working on with the conference is about Israel and Palestine, which is like the perfect one for right now. So uh, please keep those folks over there in Israel and Palestine in prayer because they really do need it. And if you have any ideas about <clears throat> what uh, to include in the resolution or what can be said about it, uh, let me know and I'll be glad to pass it on. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, are there any other announcements? If not, then we rise for the call to worship. <clears throat> God, your love, stronger than death, finds and renews us with life. Your Holy Spirit awakens us to life. Deepen our understanding of your infinitely divine nature through your words and works. Descend upon us so well to peace. May the flames of our faith swell like the tides within our hearts. Unite us with us in the faith. Through the glory of our Christ risen. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we bow our heads and lift our hearts to you, giving thanks for the blessings of the past week and for the promises of the week to come. And we pray, gracious God, that you will be with us now as we worship, that your spirit might be upon us, that we might be your disciples in this place. For we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, and the proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And our second reading comes from Romans 8, verses 22 to 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, and now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. For that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here ends our reading for this morning. Good morning, officially. Good morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. In many traditions, it's considered the birthday of the church. Hence my sermon title, Another Birthday. Anybody stop counting your birthdays yet? Some of us, somebody joked me the other day, they turned the numbers around. So when she's 72, she just says she's 27. It feels better. It is another birthday. I don't want you to think, though, of using up your life. I like to think of birthdays as a good excuse for starting a new thing. And on Pentecost, there's a lot of new things to think about. Did today's scripture passage sound familiar? I was amused. Linda said she gets picked every year to read on her Sunday. <laughs> Maybe it just seems that way with all those funny words. It actually, you know, there's a, a rhythm to the scripture passage. It's called a, a lectionary. It's a three-year process, and it's supposed to take you through the whole Bible. But it is interesting to me, all three years of the lectionary have the Acts reading for today on Pentecost Sunday because it is the one story of Pentecost in the Bible. So if it felt like a rerun, it probably should have. You've heard it before. The story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. In many traditions, you're told to wear red. I wore a red tie, that's the closest I got. Um, I've been in churches where they have balloons. We used to have helium balloons till we figured out letting those go was not such a good thing for the birds. Anything to talk about the spirit or the movement of God seems to come up from Pentecost. For me, this time, reading that passage and 
reading about everybody being able to speak their own language and understand the gospel story, A, it's a miracle, but B, I've spent the last couple of years tutoring citizenship students. They come from all different countries. I've had students from Russia, from China, from India, a couple from India, one from Chile. I have one now from Morocco and one from Syria. The citizenship test has 100 questions. A couple of them you would have trouble with, but if you, 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 can, you know the 100 questions ahead of time. So if you read them all over and read the answers, trust me, you all would pass, even though you have no idea what the Federalist Papers are or who wrote them. But it's one of the questions, so we study it. But what I've found is I can get everybody through those 100 questions, and I can get them through reviewing their 20-page application they have to fill out to become a citizen. What trips them up is the English language. Because in order to become a citizen, you have to be able to read a few sentences in English, and you have to be able to write a few sentences in English. In fact, the last couple of weeks, I've been torturing two students that you need to learn how to spell Washington. Because whether it's the founder of our country, George Washington, or the capital of our country, Washington, D.C., about 15 of those 100 questions have the word Washington in them. So you got to learn that. And I've begun to experience just how hard it is to learn English. It's not, it, it's, it's a real challenge. Well, meeting all those people from different countries has helped me to appreciate the diversity of the world. And today I want to share with you about diversity and the importance it is for our churches and the importance it is for our life. As I thought about today, it occurred to me how many of the religious ideas that I gained in my life have come from other traditions, other Protestant traditions. I learned about foot washing from the church. Never did it in the church I was growing up in, and to be honest, I've never had any success getting a congregation to do it with me. But there are congregations that do a foot washing service every year, after the story of John when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. When I was in seminary, I pastored a Presbyterian church on the west side of Chicago, and in the local community, we did one of those great pulpit supply swaps. We all traded churches for one Sunday. I got assigned a church that was about four blocks from mine, so I taught Sunday school, got in my car, and started driving over to where I was supposed to lead the worship service. There were two traffic lights between my church and the other church, and when I got to the second traffic light, a guy who had been up drinking all night and had been in a knife fight Keep on my car. My car was totaled. I remember my glasses came off and I couldn't see. And I thought, oh my gosh, what has happened to me? Until I found my glasses and put them back on and I was in better shape. I got delivered by a police car to that church to preach the sermon. It was very dramatic. I got there about 20 minutes late, but they weren't the least bit worried. And I was a little concerned about communion, but they said, not to worry. In our church, the lay people serve communion. Just sit there and watch. People do things differently. There's a lot of different ways to do it in churches. I learned from my wife's Episcopalian tradition about kneeling. I also learned that if you kneel while wearing a robe, you have to be careful when you stand up. I don't like robes. Um, I learned about Seder meals and agape meals from my Jewish brothers and sisters. I learned a lot of things about music. And I learned about this smock I'm wearing. 10 or 11 years ago, I spent two, mo two months in God. Uh, I was part of a program trying to work on microfinance, small loans, and small saving programs in God. It was a wonderful experience. And uh, out of that, I've had a lot of appreciation for God. This is a smock from God. It's what traditionally is worn. While that summer, while I was there, uh, I said to one of the office people, you know, I'd like to go to church this Sunday. She suggested I should go to the Presbyterian church that was about four miles away. So I got a ride that morning. I went to the big Presbyterian church. I grew up Presbyterian. I went to a Presbyterian seminary. I thought I'd fit right in. And I did, to the extent that the one white person in the church with a thousand black people could fit in. I fit in right away. Their tradition, they taught me a new tradition, was that when it was time for the offering, instead of passing the plate, all the thousand people came up to the front and put money in the offering plate from the altar. It takes about 20, 25 minutes for a thousand people to go up and do the offering. They played music the whole time, so 
the organ is heard repeat. And some of them, it was a fashion show, like me, especially for the women, I think. For some, it was an excuse to dance, to celebrate. And I did the white man thing. I walked up very carefully, put my money, and went back down because I didn't want to prove that I couldn't dance. But you get the idea. It takes a lot of variety. You know, I've had the honor in the last few years of working with some Muslim people, working on citizenship and English, and they taught me about Ramadan, just ended a few weeks ago, and how they fast all day long. What a discipline. So I have a current student, Beatty, is from Iran. In fact, he's in Iran right now. How's that for scary? He went back to visit some relatives. Uh, I'm not sure why, but anyhow, he did. I was asking him during Ramadan if he fasted. He said, nah, I got these. Maybe he's a little older than me. He said, hey, he had some heart issues. And if you're Muslim and you have illnesses, or if you're children, or if you're pregnant, you don't need to do the fasting thing. So he stopped fasting a few years ago, but he does pray. He does believe in the God of love, but he doesn't attend the mosque. And when we were talking about it, he explained to me that so he grew up, he, his whole life was in Iran until just three years ago. He said, when the Ayatollah, religious leader took over the government of Iran, he quit going to the mosque. Because he watched what the Ayatollah did and how he lived. And he didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Basically said, so he reminded me of how important it is that it's not just the words we say that are our sermon, but it's how we live. When you see a leader who doesn't live according to the faith, it doesn't make any difference how many words they say or how important they are. People aren't going to follow. The Dalai Lama, another religious leader, had one of the best sentences ever. He said, My religion is kindness. My religion is kind. Now that's something we also remember. And of course, our Jewish friends have taught us a lot. I, I smile now. I, I uh, do a little financial support for an organization called Pius, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. They help immigrants, and I like the idea of helping immigrants. Particularly what amuses me about them is they always ask for either 18 or 36 dollars. So I asked one of my Jewish friends, um, what's that all about? Why, uh, and he explained to me that the number 18, the Jewish characters for the number 18, are the same as the characters for the word life. So they often ask you for 18. He actually told me sometimes they ask for $180. That's a little harder to do. But for me, it's kind of hard if somebody asks me for $18 or $36 to help immigrants. How do you say no to that? He's kind of taught me a lot that way. 10, 10 well, 2013, so eight years ago, I retired from the ministry. First thing I did the week after I retired is I went to Auschwitz. I went with a Buddhist group, the Zen peacemakers. There were about 60 of us, 20 Buddhist people from around the world, 20 Jewish people from around the world, 10 guilty Germans, I just call them that because they all felt guilty and that's why they were there, and 10 curious Americans. And we spent a week at Auschwitz, most of it sitting on the railroad tracks meditating about the atrocities that happened there. We had the experience of every day we would leave. Auschwitz is like a museum. I mean, it's a huge place with some buildings and some fields, but there's no food allowed in. So every day at lunchtime, we would leave Auschwitz and go stand outside the fence and have soup and bread, trying to identify with what the people had gone through there. And I identified with the stories you heard of people who said, hmm, I hope I get my soup from the bottom of the can before it's a little thicker. I also thought to myself at the time, the soup and the bread we're eating is a lot better than what those prisoners got. It helped me to think about their needs. We had one experience that strikes me though. You would think, I mean, this was a pretty religious group. And yet there was one time when one man, one Buddhist man, got very upset. We had divided into two groups, women and men, and gone two different directions. And we'd gone to barracks. So the men went to a men's barrack women went to a women's barrack, and we sat there in the barrack, and reflected a little bit about what life was like for those prisoners. And then one of the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis that was with us, had brought a string instrument, I don't know what it was called, and he started playing a very soft, sad melody. 
some of the Jewish people started singing. And those of us who didn't know the words, we would just hum along. We just kind of sat there meditating, listening to the music. And when it ended, the Buddhist fellow was very upset. He thought that playing music and singing and that holy sight was not showing enough respect for the people who had died there. The Jewish rabbi tried to explain that probably the Jewish people who were in that barrack probably did sing songs and that this was a way to honor them. And what struck me, one of the biggest lessons from that whole week, the biggest challenge for all of us as religious folks is to see other people. They have other ways of doing things. It's new or it's different to us. Sometimes we get offended. I kind of introduced you all to that with the idea of an Monday Sunday. Sometimes that offends some people. And I like to remind everybody of what I call rule number six. It's the story of a peace negotiation going on between two countries. Probably imagine Palestine and Israel this week. And in the midst of some very intense negotiations, a citizen of one of the countries comes in and starts waving his hands and yelling and saying, ah, ah, ah. And the, the negotiator says, hey, remember rule number six. The guy calms down and walks away. It happens two more times. And every time it happens, hey, remember rule number six. Finally, they stop all the negotiations and say, all right, what is rule number six? The man says to him, well, rule number six is a very good rule. Don't take yourself so seriously. The man says, oh, that is a good rule in life. What are the other rules? And he says, there aren't any. Just don't take yourself too seriously and enjoy the differences and see what you can learn from each other. The passage goes on to tell us that your young men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. And I love the words of the hymn today. I didn't realize it until, we were, until I was listening closely. Because they, you know, the, the Bible oftentimes says things twice. That's what they do in Hebrew poetry. So when you say things twice, I often just shrug and go, yeah, yeah, it's Hebrew poetry. They're saying it twice again, so I'll get it. But here they talk about young men and old men in the scripture passage. I like what the hymn does, because it switches it and says, our women see visions, our men clear their eyes. I like that even better. Well, the idea is that we have to learn from each other and we learn from our differences. And we have to have a vision of where we're going. I'm going to share one with you this morning from a, I guess you'd call it a poem. It's called The Kingdom Without Walls by Cynthia Langdon Kirk. Feel free to shut your eyes while we have this vision. Imagine a place where mercy resides. Love forms each heart. Compassion lived out with grit and determination. A place where lavish signs mark each path barrier free. Imagine a place where skin tones are celebrated like the hues of tulip in springtime, where languages inspire, where symphonies of diversity with respect school us in custom and history, and every conversation begins with a bow of reverence. Imagine a place where each person wears glasses, clarity of vision for all, recognizing each one, everything, made in the image of God. Imagine a place where carrots and pasta, doctor skills and medications are not chained behind barbed wire, food, shelter, health care available for all. Imagine a place where every key of oppression was melted down to form public art. Huge fish, doves, lions and lambs on which children could play. Imagine a place where people no longer kept watch through the front window to determine whether the welcome mat would remain on the porch. Such is the work, the journey, the destination, and the kingdom of God. You know, it struck me when I talk about new beginnings, it's a little bit what your church is going through right now. Another new beginning, searching for a pastor. It'll be tempting to do it just like you did the last 11 times. But of course we know it's different now, right? Nothing else the pandemic taught us. It taught us how to do worship services on Facebook Live or some churches YouTube. It taught us how to do virtual everything, it seems. And you wonder what the future will bring and how it will be different. The 
church, of course, has some rules and regulations. They're not always helpful. And I'm often reminded of my old church out in Oregon. I had a, as a pastor of a small country church with about 100 people. We had a well and a septic system and a dishwasher. Although in order to have a dishwasher that met the county health requirements, it wasn't really a dishwasher, it was a sterilizer. So when we had meals, you washed the dishes by hand and then you ran them through the sterilizer to make sure they were really sterile and clean before you used them again. What it makes me think of is the time I was doing the dishes, because I'm a big believer that I should do everything. And Audrey, one of the saints, came up to me and she started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing about? And she said, Dave, Make sure you do it right. I knew there were a lot of rules about how to use the sterilizer, but I said, what are you talking about? She just kept laughing. She said, there's at least 12 different women in this church who will come up and tell you how to do it right. And they will 12 tell you 12 different ways. Good luck, make sure you do it right. I think about that, and I thought about that when with Paul's letter to the Romans. He talks about the earth, with that wonderful word, groaning the labor pains of things being created. And groaning is what you'll go through as a church, finding a new pastor, the labor pains of a new ministry. It can be painful. It also can be exciting. What new things will you learn? What new directions will you go? What new customers will you be exposed to? I grew up reading a magazine called Sojourners. It's 50 or 60 years old now. The guy who is the leading light for for many, many years just retired, Jim Wallace. He also was a big baseball fan and he coached both his boys in baseball and he tells the story of his boys playing Little League Baseball and they had with them a new boy who had moved to the United States from England. And he didn't really know the rules of baseball, but he knew how to swing a bat. They were playing the game. Wallace's team was behind, the boys were getting nervous, but they started to come back. And this boy from England got up the bat, a couple of pitches, and bam! He had it way into the outfield, and he ran like heck to first base, and he ran like heck to second base, and they told him to stop, so he stopped there, and they threw the ball back into the pitcher. And then he stepped off the base to go over and shake the shortstop's hand. He didn't know what the rules were. They yelled at him, he got back on the base finally, and afterwards he came back and he was talking to Wallace, and he said, hey, I've never been there before. That's what you're going to have to experience as a church. We've never been there before. We don't know what the next few years will bring. We don't know what the next few months will be. What we do know is that you'll go there with God and God's spirit. And new and exciting things can happen. And we can learn from each other. And we can be a part of building the kingdom of God. Amen.
join with me in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we bow our heads and we lift our hearts to you, giving thanks for your presence with us here today. We give thanks for eyes that can see and ears that can hear and hearts that can feel the needs around us and for a spirit of generosity and compassion that we might be part of building the kingdom of heaven. A place where we all recognize that we're related and that we're all your children. We give thanks this day, O oh Lord, for diversity, for the different ways that you speak to us and to the world around us. We pray, O oh Lord, this day for those who are struggling with COVID, I ask that the doctors and the nurses might be instruments of your healing care. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are struggling with cancer, that you might strengthen and comfort them. We pray for the poor, we pray for the lonely, we pray for the confused. We pray, O oh Lord, for leaders, political leaders, corporate leaders, and ask some church leaders. We pray that our upcoming synod might be successful, and that you might be with the leadership of this church as they seek a new pastor. We lift up all these prayers and gather here this day as disciples of Jesus Christ, joining together in the prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank those of you who have sent in your offering and appreciate those who continue to loyally support the church. I remind you that the special offering for May is for Phoebe Lincoln Home, and we offer our gifts to God. Amen. gather at the communion table to share in the service of communion today on Pentecost Sunday. Those of you on, at home, we hope that you've gathered some bread and some juice and can join with us. Listen to these words of the invitation. We gather at this table and remember how on the night when Jesus was handed over, he gathered his disciples in the upper room, and they shared in an ordinary meal that has extraordinary implications. For at this table, Jesus broke bread and shared wine with the ones who betrayed him. He broke bread and shared wine with the one who deserted him. He broke bread and shared wine with the one who doubted him. He broke bread and shared wine with those disciples, folks just like you and me. We had our doubts, we had our concerns, we sometimes have faith that wavers. 
So wherever we gather at this table to share the bread and the cup in the community of faith, we proclaim Jesus' life. We affirm that there's a place at this table for everyone. As the United Church of Christ likes to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here and you are welcome at this table. As we approach this table, there's a story off of the Confederate War about General Lee. He was the Confederate general. And after the war, good Episcopalian that he was, he went to church, went to communion, and knelt at the rail a lot like this. And next to him knelt a black man, a freed slave. Afterwards, the pastor went to him and said, General, what was that like for you? bother you? And the report is that General Lee said, Sir, the ground in front of the communion table is level for everyone. I tell that story as we approach this table because all of us have sinned and fallen short. Let us silently do our prayer of confession as we approach the table. Let us pray. gracious God because I do believe we worship a God of forgiveness and of grace more than that I believe we worship a God of second chances third chances fourth chances and on and on and on friends believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ you are forgiven The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and prayers. Let us pray. O God, Spirit most high, to you we give our thanks that you breathe into us new life. We praise you and bless you for creation and for the gift of life. For your abiding love which brings us close to you the source of all blessing we thank you for the revealing of your will for us in the giving of the law and in the preaching of the prophets we thank you for the gift of your son jesus christ who came that we might have life and have it abundantly we celebrate the coming of the holy spirit to gather your church by which your work may be done in the world and through which we share the gift of faith with the faithful in every time and place, we praise the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Here are the words of the institution the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it, shared it with his disciples and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. Drink of it, all of you. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Would you pray with me? God of all, May your Holy Spirit find us renewed at your table of life. May this bread and cup man the flames of hope and faith united. Gather your peoples with your grace unending, strengthening us in a love that knows no limits of place, time, or language. 
We ask this in the name of the resurrected Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, prepare your hearts, for all things are now ready. Oh, if you can take the top off and find the wafer. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. covenant poured out for you. Amen. Let's all join in the prayer of thanksgiving. Loving God, we thank you for giving us the share of one bread and the one cup that makes us one with Christ. Help us bring the joy of your salvation to all the world. Strengthen our faith, increase our love, and let us glow with your light in our lives. Through Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. Thank you. 